Hi, everybody. How are you doing? Uh, my name is Dr. Rachel O'Connell, and I'm founder and CEO of Trust Elevate, which is a child age verification parental consent uh, provider. So I'm going to be talking... My background is in forensics, tracking paedophile activity on the internet and looking at the implications for investigative strategies. So I worked with law enforcement in uh, European member states, uh, Interpol and the FBI, understanding how people with ill intent leverage the uh, technology to get access to kids. I was then, I set up the first um, UK Internet Safety Centre and one in Ireland and Spain, and there's a really cool one in Malta. Uh, um, and we were developing programmes of education. It's like, how do you educate people, children and young people of different ages, about how to stay safe online? And how do you also educate their parents and young people? And then I, was, and I uh, like Karen, I went into industry then. I was uh, chief security officer for Bebo, a social networking site, um, which is kind of around early Facebook time. And oh my God, when I, I was responsible for the abuse management systems and saw the stuff that came in that was promoting uh, thinspiration, pro-anorexia, pro-bulimia, pro-suicide. I was like, oh my God. And obviously paedophile activity. So it was working with mental health organizations to say, we need to think about how we signpost these kids to the right sort of support that they need so that these, situation, these, these problems don't get worse, right? And often if you're dealing with somebody who's maybe self-harming, may also be anorexic, you need to think about how you uh, put the right uh, measures in place to support them. Um, and then laterally, in the last 12 years, I've been working in the digital identity space because all of that work made me believe we need to create safer spaces for children and young people, right? We need for platforms to know the age bands of their users so that they can create safer spaces. And if you use a real world analogy, if you go to a big like roller coaster park, those are designed, they're safety by design. So if you're really this height, you're not getting on the adult um, roller coaster ride. And we as parents and young people and teenagers and kids, well, particularly teenagers, if an accident happens, we're like, hang on, we're going to sue somebody and they're liable and they need, they should have taken more care to potentially make this a safe place. What age verification and parental consent represents is bringing that into the digital platforms, right? Making sure that those places are designed. And in exactly the same way that Adults, kids, parents, children can inhabit a uh, an, an amusement park. Um, they can also inhabit the same space on online, right? So very often civil libertarians think, oh, if there's age verification, that's going to inhibit people's uh, opportunities to participate. That's exactly the opposite. Um, age verification, the purpose is to enhance children's rights. Children have just as much of a right to participate in a digital environment that is safe as adults do uh, accessing whatever kind of content they want to. Um, so I did a whole load of work with uh, the UK government around the verification of children online. So the government said, right, let's bring all the experts together. Let's bring social workers in. Let's bring teachers in. Let's bring technologists, ethicists, lawyers, policy makers, young people. Let's understand what children want. Because if you're designing a system that's going to impact on children, you must listen to their voices, right? What do they want? So this is an outline of the verification of children online and the rationale behind it. Is the video, please? ...has big ambitions for the UK to be the safest place in the world for internet users. It's recently issued the online harms white paper, which sets out this aim and specifically recognises the need for extra protections for children. Children have different needs to adults and they deserve to be protected online the same way as they are offline. This should be true regardless of where they're connecting from and the services they're using. Although their needs differ, children have the right to explore, learn, play and grow in the online environment, just as adults do. It's widely accepted that platforms which appeal to teenagers will inevitably attract younger users as well, expecting younger children to self-exclude when their friends are using these services is a huge ask. We also know that sometimes parents are not aware of the apps and games their children are using. Navigating the various privacy and safety settings can be overwhelming. 
where they do have concerns. They may have the dilemma of allowing their children to access inappropriate services or excluding them entirely. For online platforms, establishing which of their users are children and their age band is challenging. So, how can we create an internet where children aren't compelled to lie about their age, the platforms they use are age appropriate, and parents are empowered to protect them online? In early 2019, a cross-sector group of experts came together to look at these problems, with the ambition that platforms would provide age-appropriate services for their actual user base. It was clear that, for this to work, a set of mutually trusted relationships would be needed between platforms, parents and children. This project is known as Verification of Children Online, or VOCO. VOCO aims to help online providers meet their regulatory obligations that expect them to know which of their users are children. As well as online harms, this includes the GDPR, which may require companies to obtain parental consent before processing children's data, and the age-appropriate design code, which will describe the design standards for platforms likely to be accessed by children. The VOCO project is moving into its second phase. We would like okay, to invite can... industry representatives to help shape the relevant processes, policies, standards and technologies required to demonstrate Okay, so that gives you an idea of, of um, the programme of work. Can I do a show of hands? How many people here would like for um, social media platforms to age check people? To age check, to check in a privacy preserving manner. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Um, so. The World Economic Forum says improving age and identity verification technologies and standards will become increasingly critical. If you've got kids um, um, that are given uh, the devices when they're in the pram, right? Just if you're, you see moms in a restaurant, it's like, here, play with this, right? It should be okay to do that. It should be okay to do that. But the way the internet has been designed, it's not okay at the moment. Um, I've put on here, we've developed an API. So it's a decentralized, um, zero data, zero knowledge model for age checking, right? What that means is that as a, th as a third party provider, we don't hold any personal data. The data that's provided is hashed on the device, the user's device is checked against authoritative data, which is also hashed, and you produce a token, which is a yes or no match. Right? So that's the standard and that I, I had the privilege of getting a whole load of experts together and, and uh, writing, and it's now becoming an international standard. So it is possible to age verify, to age check people in a privacy preserving way. Right? Um, and the next slide. Oh, that's me. <laughs> Sorry. Um, right, so then I was going to talk about the risks and harms and the roles of algorithms. How the data rights and children's rights, and our, all of our rights, are intimately intertwined. Um, because we're tracked online all of the time, there are data points that contribute to a psychographic profile. Right now, online, there's a psychographic profile of every single one of you that relates to how uh, you're feeling, what, what's the status of your relationship, your political orientations, your sexual um, um, deviance, what, you know, what, an intimate, intimate amount of information about you, also about every single child and young person, right? Also about that. It doesn't have to be that way. That's the business model that's underpinning the attention economy. Let's have a look. Sorry if this is going to be slightly triggering, but I keep it. So up in the uh, corner, this is Molly Russell, a girl who was suffering with a bit of anxiety and depression. She was exposed to a huge amount of content relating to pro-suicide content, to the degree that the coroner at her inquest said that social media is implicated in her death. Think about that for a second. Young children in their bedrooms, dealing with, as a, a teenager, it's a difficult time. The content you are absolutely flooded with is telling you how to commit suicide and why you should commit suicide. Similarly, um, with self-harm and eating disorders, EDs, right? So a kid may be called like, oh, you're chubby in, in, cl in class, go on a YouTube video about dieting. Then they're purging, they're calorie restricting, 
Um, they're looking at thin-spo stuff. So children's, it's like a massive social experiment that's been happening with children and young people. And we're seeing the negative impacts in terms of eating disorders and the spikes in um, self-harm and uh, suicidal thoughts. And then the, uh, the viral um, choking blackout challenge. There have been seven deaths. The parents are taking a class action against the companies for that. Uh, nothing tastes as good as skinny feels, right? And you think about society and culture as well. We're moving from thick, thin, the Kim Kardashian body model, to back to heroin chic. And there are drugs out there that um, make you when, you, you, when you take the drug, you are repulsed by food, right? So the whole narrative that's there, it's not just user-generated content. This is coming from brands also. Heroin chic. Um, and this wonderful chap, does anybody recognize him? <laughs> This is an incel guy who called the police because when he stalked the woman he used to work with and she ran away from him, he called the police and said, um, she uh, ran away from me. She should, uh, she's obliged to listen to me. I'm, I'm a man, um, that, right? I wanted to show her my song. So why is she running away from me? And then her dad called me. I want you to go, please, to her dad who told me he'd kill me, for stalking his daughter. And the policeman was like, what, wait, you were, you were chasing a woman, right? So there's this whole incel thing online, which is uh, associated with homegrown terrorism and misogyny and uh, homophobia, which basically says women are lesser than men. Uh, they are, we're all basically uh, women of the night. Um, and uh, trying to manipulate men, and men feel disempowered, and therefore they have a right to stalk us and, and be rude, etc., to us online. Children and young people are having to deal with this, right? These are the things that six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven-year-olds and twelve-year-olds are having to deal with. Um, the normalization of the sharing of sex. Just look. I mean, read it and weep. Look at those stats in. 40% of children in the US believe it's normal for people my age to share nudes with other kids. Now, these are 14 to 17-year-olds. When you go lower than that, kids feel that it's normal. When we conducted research with uh, children, we were listening to children's voices, and we asked them about their experience online. They were like, I just want to talk to my friends. I don't want to see naked pictures. I don't want to be asked for them. Um, right? Now, what we're seeing online is, let me give you an example of how harmful the algorithms are. We've, we've talked about the algorithms detecting that you're looking at stuff about eating disorders. And when kids are going on TikTok, right, you, and you live stream on TikTok, so you set it up and you might, kids might have a sleepover, so they're like doing a live dance or doing what the latest, I'm not a very good dancer, but you know, doing whatever, right? <laughs> so they're expecting other kids of the same age to be on there, right? And then if you listen, you'll hear, hey cutie, you're so sweet, I love you. Lift your top, spread your legs, right? Fourfold increase in the production and the sharing of child sexual abuse material online. And it's called self-generated, which is a really bad label for that, because the kids are kind of coerced into it. They want to be influencers. They, they go online, they see the number of uh, users watching them, and they're like, oh, we could be maybe influencers. There's like 20 people, oh, 40, 60, 80, 100 people. Because the algorithm, um, in the same way that if you like cooking and comedy, you see lots of recipes in cooking comedy. If you're an adult with a sexual interest in children, the algorithm's like, you don't need to search any further. We know you like blonde-haired girls around eight years of age. We'll just connect you to all of them. And not only that, we'll connect you with other adults with a sexual interest in children. So you can communicate with each other behind the back. So when the, when the guys are like, hey, cutie, do this or do that, if the kids don't respond, they all drop off. So the guys are coordinating and social engineering the kids, and the kids are like, maybe just this once, I'll do something. And then you see extortion happening, I'm, I'm going to share this. So these are the things that eight, nine, six, seven, eight, nine, ten year olds are having to deal with, right? This is the normalization of child sexual abuse related activities online. And this is a worry. Would you agree? Yeah. Um, now, wonderfully, the Convention on the Rights of the Child 
uh, comment 25 basically says, companies have a duty of care to create a safe environment for children and young people online. There is a legal duty of care to create a, a safer space. Companies must put, uh, currently profit is, it supersedes everything else, they must put child's rights and safety above profits. Right? So we now have a way in which that can be codified into law. And there are various pieces of legislation that are out there. Alex and I differ in terms of, I believe, I've worked within a company, Karen's worked within a company. No, companies are driven by profit. They're not going to do, oh, maybe we should do the right thing. Nah, they're not going to do that, right? They have to be forced to do it. Um, so one of the other areas we're working on is developing a child rights impact assessment because most software engineers and product developers are not thought about ch children's rights, not thought to consider deep learning, machine learning, algorithms, uh, AI. What is the impact of that combined with behavior modification techniques such as endless scroll and loot boxes? What are the associated risks, harms and mitigations for specific age bands. So that's a huge piece of work that um, we're working on. And that's generated because of the, UN, the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, Comment 25, which is how do you articulate how companies can exercise um, a responsibility? Because the majority, like nearly 100, uh, probably 100% of, of software engineers do not want to have this kind of harm resulting uh, from their products and services. So how do we put it in place a system? There are also drivers. The GDPR Article 8 that requires companies to obtain parental consent before processing data is really instrumental in driving forward um, an understanding that children have rights too. They have the right not to be profiled. They have the right to say, what data do you have about me? And for teenagers, they're like, mm, often, I don't care everybody's data. And then you say, mm, do you know that if you're applying for a job as an apprentice or to get into university or get a job or get your car insurance, there's been data harvesting at the background which gives the company, the university, the car insurance people a score in relation to the risk that you uh, relate to you. And people are like, what? Yeah, there's a black box that makes decisions like Karen mentioned. So your life choices, your opportunities in life can be negatively impacted by these, uh, this data ga gathering and harvesting in the back end. Um, so the companies that are affected, okay. do So there's a multi-sided kind of uh, in business impact uh, and digital, um, and basically I want to echo some of the things that were said this morning. It's our responsibility to stand up. Uh, in all age groups to say, this is not acceptable. And I'll just show you this um, video of an age verification experience. It's just like one minute. I just enter my name, birthday, and mother's phone number. It takes seconds to protect your kids online. That was easy. Take two minutes to protect your children online. Make sure they see only age-appropriate content and have age-appropriate contact. 